Hi, I'm Daryl Cagle, and this is the Cagle Cast, where we're all about political cartoons. And today I'm talking to Rivers, who is our anonymous, very conservative cartoonist. Let's start with this first donkey and elephant. Donkey Democrat says, I still love you, man, even though you're a fascist for supporting Trump. And the elephant says, I love you too, even though you obviously enjoy innocent Ukrainian children being blown apart by cluster bombs because you support Biden. Yeah, well, the idea, of, of course, is that Republicans often get to blame for supporting Trump because obviously they, they support everything about Trump, which isn't necessarily true. So I was just throwing that back just to say, well, you know, just because you support somebody over another person doesn't mean that you necessarily attribute or you subscribe to all of their uh, their antics. Well, you know, it's a small minority of, of Republicans that don't support the military aid to Ukraine. Yeah, that is true. And I think I'm probably one of them. I don't think that it's a, it's a good idea to continue to push weapons on a country that is inevitably going to lose this war. Or perhaps even draw the rest of the world into a direct military contact with Russia. You don't think that withdrawing military support from them would lead to drawing more countries into the war? You'd see the Baltic states and Poland immediately jump into it to support Ukraine. Yeah, not not necessarily. I mean, we're we're speculating here, but I would say that we're looking at a situation in which Russia is a, a nuclear-powered country. I think we need to treat them with respect. They obviously had a, a reason, uh, which, you know, just so you hear this, I don't support Putin at all. I, th I think what he did was was um, beyond the pale, but at the same time, uh, they had been warning NATO and uh, the United States that uh, they always found the Ukraine's inclusion into NATO as a, a direct threat to them. And they've obviously had some longstanding issues with uh, Ukraine. So again, so you hear this, because I know that uh, Trump supporters or conservatives often get uh, confused for supporting Putin. We absolutely don't. I think the guy's... Uh, uh, a maniac, but at the same time, uh, you know, we're not completely innocent in all of this either. We've we've obviously done some things to trigger, and I, and and as I understand, um, you, know, you know, if you were fully supportive of Putin, these are just the things that you would say, right? And that that's not necessarily supporting Putin. That's just uh, acknowledging that there is some inconsistency with our arguments. It's it's the same as we could have because I know Russia has asked for peace at least twice now. And the U.S. has um, basically denied that offer. So I don't know what the, the end game is here, because at some point, um, you know, we could end up having, as I said, a direct military conflict with Russia. And that would be a very, very bad thing because they have some, they have, some, well, they have pretty good military arsenal. Uh, they have a, a really good uh, nuclear arsenal. And they could uh, easily make it a very bad day for most of the U.S. So you're fine with them getting rid of all those neo-Nazis in Ukraine and rebuilding their empire because we shouldn't be involved in this and they're a country that deserves respect. Um, I didn't say that either. I think that, as I said, they've, they've struck for peace, peace twice now. So well, you how know, so? They, well, they've I asked mean, they, for, I mean, they've well, not struck for peace. They, they've asked for, for negotiations twice now to, you know, to, uh, to end this war and the U.S. has directly intervened and said no. So we are in a situation in which for some reason, I don't know what the end game is because we're, the Ukrainians aren't going to win this war. I mean, it's very clear that Russia has a, um, a much greater army and they, they're going to uh, eventually wear out the Ukrainians. Uh, so we can send them as many, you know, uh, tanks uh, and uh, airplanes and whatever we want to send them. The reality is is that uh, Russia just has a much more vast uh, um, array of weapons and people, and so they're eventually going to lose this war. And for what end? Um, and and How, why is that clear to you? Just simply because it's it's, it's inevitable because Russia has way more in terms of their military uh, strength. I mean, it's I, I really. But they're also corrupt and incompetent. Well, that's very true. And, you know, again, you know, so you hear me again, I don't, I don't like what the Russians are doing. I don't, I don't like this war. I, I wish, uh, like, um, uh, uh, you know, like Trump has said, at this point, it's a matter of saving lives, right? You're like, nobody. So when they invade Lithuania well, next, 
you'd be okay with uh, not being involved at all in that too? Of course, that's different because they're in NATO, but uh, how different is that really? Well, they're in NATO, so there's Article 5, right? And and mm -hmm. again, you know, I think you, res Russia you respect that you wouldn't you wouldn't respect the the Russians over over uh, NATO. So the only reason regarding Ukraine is that they're just not in, in NATO for you. Well, no, th that's the thing is that I mean Russia has been uh, for many years saying that that they aren't they are 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 not prepared to have Ukraine in NATO. That is a it's it's, it's you you think this is about NATO. It's been, it's, they have been warning about this for a very long time. I'm sure that if there's some. It's one of a list of, of dozens a, of things that they complain about. There, there's a list of things for sure. But I mean, it's a war that, that the Ukrainians are, are uh, uh, they're, they're being depleted. Uh, it's their, it's their young men that are being killed. Um, um, you know, we're, we're basically sustaining a war that's unwinnable. As I said, you know, if, if, the Russians are prepared to sit down and talk. Why wouldn't we want to talk? So, Daryl, what is the end game? You tell me. The reason we wouldn't want to talk is that they want negotiations with America and not Ukraine. And they attacked Ukraine. It's not the role of America to negotiate on behalf of Ukraine when they refuse to talk to Ukraine. They're attacking and killing Ukrainians. Yeah, um, but they want to negotiate with us because what they want is to take over Ukraine and have us not give them any support. Okay, they're, so they're not they're not negotiating an end to the war. They're trying to make a deal with this country that's bothering them. That's outside of the conflict. Right, and 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 that's understandable considering it's the U.S. that's supplying Ukraine with the weapons. And so, it's also understandable why the United States would not accept that negotiation. Right. Well, then then what is the end game? Are we going to end up The end game is Russia falls apart because they're corrupt and incompetent. Oh, I don't know about that. that that's very possible. I I I I that they would They certainly be... have a a history of falling apart. Oh, that would be lovely. I mean, we would all love that. And I think um uh you know, that would be kind of like a dream come true, but at the same time, um I think that's much more likely than Ukraine losing. Potentially, okay. Well, if that is if that's what you think could happen, if that's uh, you know, then then that's fine. But at the same time, I I think that we are playing a very dangerous game because we're inching ever closer to that to that time in which we may be involved directly against uh, uh, Russia and Russia. Would I would not... I wouldn't call it a game. You know, it's it's very serious when one country just decides to murder the civilian populace of their neighbor because they want to rebuild their historical empire, which is really what this is about. It's not about NATO. It's about wanting to be like Ivan the Terrible and Catherine the Great, a, a huge ego on a country that really doesn't have the substance to support the ego. When somebody's ego is on the line, when they look like fools, as they have been, that just makes them more dangerous and more unstable and more likely to collapse and more of a mess. And that's a big achievement for Ukraine so far. Right. But what happens if they don't fall apart? What happens if your scenario doesn't happen? Then we've clearly shown that there's a high price for Russia to invade their neighbors and try to rebuild their empire. We've united the world in pushing back against that and defending the sovereignty of nations, which is a legacy of World War II, where we saw that not defending the sovereignty of nations led to situations that were much, much worse. We should learn the lessons of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the lessons of history uh, are also, uh, um, you know, present with when you keep being warned uh, not to do something, and you do something, you 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 can often enter into conflict. I mean, we had we had a situation in 1962 in which the U.S. was very firm about not having missiles in Cuba, and we almost entered into a nuclear war with uh, the USSR at that time, right? So. With Russia, as I said, many times they have said that they do not want, uh, uh, and I know we, we, just, we just talked about this, so we're beating a dead horse, but they're very clear about the presence of NATO. They see it as a direct threat, uh, being constantly um, uh, at their doorstep, basically, uh, harassed by this, by this country. So, um, again... I'm not a Putin fan. I don't like Putin. I don't like anything about what they're doing. 
But at the same time, there was plenty of warning about this, and we, we certainly could have mitigated the outcome, and we didn't. The position you take on this puts you in the camp of the nuttiest, farthest right-wing Trumpy Republicans, uh, minority of Republicans, I should say, because most of them aren't that crazy. And uh, <laughs> So you're calling me crazy? Or th- I'm saying that you choose the company of the most crazy when you take this position. Yeah, How that, do you feel about the company you keep? Well, okay. So again, so you hear what I'm saying. We are not at all interested, and and I'm not at all interested in supporting Putin or any of Putin's uh, 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 statements or anything that is, you know, Russian misinformation or or. uh, And neither are you interested in supporting Ukraine. You are you're taking an entirely isolationist position. You don't want to be involved at all. I think that's fair. Yes, I do. And I don't think necessarily that the U.S. should be involved in it. I think that uh, uh, certainly as a peacemaker, the U.S. can be involved. But from what I've seen, the U.S. is doing nothing but profiting from war again, sending over weapons. Um, that's, that's Well, as I see it, what they're doing by sending over weapons is taking the role of the peacemaker. You know, you could say that, but at the same time, there's there's been the opportunities to sit down and end this conflict. They've chosen not to. They'd rather just send their weapons. And like I said, your end game obviously seems to be uh, that somehow Russia is going to fall apart. I don't know if that's going to happen. It would be a dream come true. Like like I said, I don't support Russia, but at the same time, uh, you know, we would. I, I think that we would benefit if we. If we tried to end this conflict, find out exactly what it is that, that can be agreed on, because I think the Ukraine has pushed Russia enough to kind of like say, hey, this isn't going to be a walkover. Uh, you know, Russia is losing a lot of a lot of their people and their military uh Assets, obviously, their their infrastructure is is being uh, destroyed. Well, their in Ukraine, invasion but... of Ukraine in military terms has culminated. They've done all that their military can do. That's as far as they've gotten, and all they can do now is defend their position. At least in the way they've conducted the war so far, there's not much left for them. So another possible outcome is that it remains in this state. And uh, Ukraine can use this opportunity to get rid of the corruption in their society, which it seems like they're on the road to doing, and create a more cohesive state that makes more sense as a member of NATO and the EU. I think that's a very plausible way that this will resolve. And then the greater good that's done by this is that Russia knows what to expect when they contemplate invading their other neighbors, like all the former Soviet states. So there are many outcomes to this that could be good. Right, right. Could be good. But at this time, it looks it looks uh, like as if we are marching to a sleepwalking, basically, into a, a, a direct conflict with Russia. And I think that that, as I said, puts us in a very, very serious um, situation because they are a nuclear powered country. They have made it very clear that they... Uh, would would use these weapons if they felt threatened and i think that we just have to be you know respectful of the fact that uh, that yes um you know obviously that you know w- what we're dealing with is is a conflict that could have been and should have been uh, resolved by now and we have refused to to even hear it just about all the same arguments that neville chamberlain made about the sudetenland in czechoslovakia Mm, yeah, well, I'm no, I'm no Neville Chamberlain, and and I don't appreciate the the, the inference here, but I do think that uh, well, he was a nice, it, respectable guy. I think he's nice and respectable. Rivers, right, right, right. But but Neville Chamberlain, I mean, it, obviously he was he was you know the the guy that we all use as the the stereotype, you know, the the buffoon who bought the whole idea that that. Uh, that uh, Hitler was a nice guy and that he could be trusted. The guy who bought he the He was judging bridge. the costs. He thought that giving Hitler this next country and then the next country was worth it because war would be so terrible. That sounds like the same argument you're making. I mean, yes, he, but- he obviously didn't like Hitler. He wanted Hitler to stop, but his judgment of the situation was, don't get involved, let him take that. It's not worth us to us to defend the Sudetenland or Czechoslovakia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I don't see myself as Neville Chamberlain. I mean, obviously, 
I think it's it's important to to have a good military and to stand up for sure. But um, but in this case, like I said, the, the I'm science... just arguing that we should learn from history. Yes, and and we should and we should learn from history. I mean, obviously, the U.S. has played a role here and and could have and should have um, made it clear that Ukraine was never going to be a part of NATO. That they understood that this was a non-negotiable for Russia. We should have respected that, and we didn't. And and so now we're in a situation in which we are potentially in a world war situation with them a direct a, a direct conflict with russia will not end well and it will not and it could involve other countries such as china and china's obviously shown that they are partial to russia uh they they're just looking for a time and a and a place for the for the us to finally be usurped as the number one power in the world and you have uh, iran and you have other countries that are circling around russia as their allies and so you have the the potential for a real end of the world kind of scenario, at, at least end of the world for us, plebes. Um, I'm sure that the the people in power will find nice little uh, bomb shelters to to uh, to reside in. But for for the rest of us, we might end up being destroyed. And and that is the scenario. That and you is don't see this as all the same arguments in the start of World War II. Well, World War II, there there was never the ability to destroy the world in, in what uh, you know twenty minutes. Uh, world War II, we did not have that. I mean, obviously, there is a there is a much much darker uh, component to this, and uh, we need to respect it because we are we are playing with a beast here, and and so you don't necessarily have to tolerate what somebody's doing or, or a power is doing like Russia, you don't necessarily have to agree with it, but you have to respect that you're, you're dealing with a very dangerous animal and you, you're going to have to make sure that if there's peace that can, that can happen, then you should take full advantage of that. Um, I think perhaps the biggest difference in our opinions is that I view not supporting Ukraine as much more dangerous than supporting Ukraine. Well, and that's how you hear this. I support Ukraine. I, in this war, I definitely support Ukraine. And I, I'm kind of glad that, that they're fighting back and that they're winning in some, some instance. Trying to say that Russia's got a lot more resources. Russia has some, some weaponry that we don't even have. And that, that they've upgraded their, their strategic nuclear capabilities to include hypersonic, which, which may, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, hopefully never gets used. They so, haven't. They haven't sent out. They haven't sent yet. out those ones yet. But but if they do, we have absolutely no defense. We have um, lots of defense. Not if they do hypers- that, they're destroying themselves. Well, that that is true. So we've always existed on the mad uh, mutual assured destruction uh, uh, policy, and hopefully that does still that still works. I mean, that there is you know obviously deterrence is good, and and we have that. But my goodness, we have. They have been uh, offering to go to the peace table at least twice now and i heard i heard what the you said the peace table meaning talking to the united states about not supporting well, I would, ukraine okay, i don't care i don't care if not they the talk. peace table with ukraine okay i don't care if they talk to 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 my mother-in-law okay as long as they are willing to sit down and talk to somebody and and i don't care if, who's involved if that means that the ukrainians aren't aren't at that table for whatever reason, but if we can at least- Well, I care. I mean, it's Ukraine that's getting murdered. Okay, yes, I agree. But Daryl, we're talking about who would sit down because your argument is, well, Ukraine wasn't wasn't invited. And that's the reason why we've decided not to uh, to go to peace or you know to, to sit down with them. My goodness, sit down with them. Sit down with Putin, find out what he's willing to negotiate, tell him what our non-negotiables are. And like Trump has said many times, if he had, if he had sat down with Putin or he, if Putin had done this, he would have told him in uncertain terms. And I think he said this uh, is kind of a veiled threat that if you do anything, you're going to regret it. You know, right. So I think that we need just that strong leadership to say, OK, let's Let's sit down. Let's talk because people are dying. That's the that's the greater good is to sit down and talk, and then just say, "Look, here's our non-negotiables. You've got to you've got to move out of the territory that you've taken, 
or there's going to, or are, are there going to be more consequences? You called me Neville Chamberlain. It's like, uh, you know, like, you know how many times I've drawn Neville Chamberlain as being the <laughs> flake who, who basically, you know, ignored. The he fact wasn't that, a flake. He was a very respectable guy. He just he, had the but, wrong view of history. Well, he did, but he was, he was, he was always striking for, you're right. He always wanted peace when, when he didn't realize that what he was dealing with was, was Hitler and Hitler. I, I don't know if Putin is Hitler. He well, may... of course they're culturally different, but Putin wants to rebuild the empire that they were embarrassed to lose. Yeah. That, you may, you might be right. I mean, obviously what is it? It was Churchill that said that Russia is a enigma wrapped in a mystery. Was that was that the right quote? But anyways, <laughs> but that is true, right? Like, how can you how can you understand Russia and and their motivations? I mean, um, they think so much differently than than we do in the West, and what we think is right and wrong, and and uh, you know that as you say, the empire building and what. That what their national pride uh, resides on, like it could be very, very true what you're saying that that Putin, being a former KGB guy, is is um, you know somewhat um, wants to wants to have his legacy and it, and actually there's some been of course been some reports that he's not well, he's physically um, dying and I'm not sure if those reports can be trusted, but but at well the he same certainly time, has gotten puffy and round. Yes, he has, and 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 he may very well, you know, not have many days left. But but you know, the question is: is he is he working on his legacy? Is he want his legacy be to be that he restored part of the the old empire? There's just two outcomes: the the one that you mentioned, which is the hopeful one, that Russia is so corrupt and that eventually people will revolt against uh, uh, Putin. But he's never been more popular. I mean, there's there's obviously going to be uh, factions within Russia that want to uh, to that will will disagree and want to take him down. But he's been he's very popular. Russia is doing very well, by the way. I mean, all the sanctions that we've that we've uh, thrown their way that doesn't seem to affect them that much. They've been pretty happy. So, um, well, they have an know, interesting strategy of uh, having only the poor who don't live in Moscow fight the war, and it may be that that <laughs> strategy is not going to last. Do you know who fought the Vietnam War, right? Mostly, the, usually the poor. A lot of the rich people, like Trump and uh, and the the Bushes and the and the Bidens of the world, they didn't they didn't send their kids off to war, um, uh, you know, they, or at least not to the Vietnam War. It was it was mostly the poor kids. Um, so you know, when you say they they send off their poor, it, this well, this, this, Biden's this, we're son, no better. Uh, Biden's son. Yes, Both he did. Yeah. When it went yes. off to war. No, but I'm talking Vietnam War, and and yes, we do have the occasion. Well, but, you but know, ta- when, but, you but go to the ta- war of the time that you're living in, right? And the Vietnam War, by and large, was fought by poor people. I mean, you have to. Well, people that. in general are by and yeah, large yeah. poor people. Not necessarily at that time in the U.S. It was, you know, you had a lot of middle class, a lot more than you had today. So well, there certainly was... are a lot of people that. Uh, got deferments and went to college, which wasn't an option yes. for a lot of people or, to get or, out of college. Or went to Canada. Yeah. Or went to Canada. And mm-hmm. uh, I think Canada was was very nice in that regard. Right, right. Well, anyways, um, but but the point is, is that I, I, don't st- I, I don't see your argument that they're sending the poor to fight the war as being any different than what we've done in the past. This is Well, we, what's we different is thing. that Russia is running out of people to uh, throw into the meat grinder, and it appears likely that they need to draw a lot more people into service now, and they're running out of the easy ones. When they get to the tough ones, that can have more impact on their society, and I'm looking forward to seeing that. I, that looks yeah. like that's in the works right now. Okay, well, and and then I just read a uh, um, uh, former U.S. general. He said that uh, Ukraine is down to a few battalions. So the question is, you know, if it's a war of attrition, uh, who's who's got the more who's got more resources to last this one out? And I think I think it's easy to say Russia does. I agree with you. I, I kind of hope that uh, you know, as you, uh, Russia does pay the cost that they they understand that they can't continue to do this and that it will cost them dearly if they they try this again um i mean obviously we we want it to sting really bad but at the same time we could do something to mitigate this other than just send send uh cluster bombs 
and and to me that is that you know getting back to that cartoon that w- we were talking about that is just the lowest of the low that you know you can talk about uh human rights violations and cluster bombs being some of the most diabolical weapons that we have that 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 often you know don't explode and then kids find them and then they they get blown apart years later or months later by playing in a you know some field and and it's like we all agreed a year ago that cluster bombs was a war crime we all agreed that so how is it that that biden gets a pass from yeah i mean obviously you voted for biden and and so did most of your cartoonists why does biden get a pass for basically uh, agreeing to allow a war crime to happen that, well I, mean, I think that's that's an error in observation that most conservatives make that the democrats voted for biden we the democrats voted against trump against i voted trump, against true. trump i think yeah. that's true of all the cartoonists it's, it's, you're going to be hard pressed to find any of the cartoonists in our group that like biden it's hard to find anybody that likes Biden. Uh, I actually but, find uh, that I find that hard to believe, Daryl, because a lot of your cartoonists are, uh, uh, just show. Uh, in fact, I just saw one today. I think it was Bagley had one where he he showed uh, Biden on skis, and he had Bidenomics had somehow uh, escaped a recession. And I, you could say, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that he supports Biden. But I've never, I have not seen, by the way very many of your cartoonists go after Biden at all. I mean, they may not have liked him, but they certainly do, don't go after him the way they go after, say, Trump or DeSantis now as the new bad guy. Oh, that, that's certainly true. Musk. It's like during the Bush years, you didn't see uh, conservative cartoonists drawing Bush and you didn't see... Uh, oh, I went after uh, Bush like... Uh, you, you know this because you know who I am. I went after Bush like a banshee. I was probably one of the first. I, and why was that? Perhaps, Dar- perhaps and why, that was why is during, that? because and why you was used that? to be a liberal. Yeah, because I used to, because I've always been anti-war and I do understand that there are times for war and there are, and obviously in the Iraq war, that was a lie. We, I knew it from the beginning. It was like, and this war, we always try to take on the that we're the we're the we're on the moral high ground, right? We're we're Americans, and we have our history and and our our ethics and our morals to to get, you know to guide us. But the reality is, our government doesn't always share those those values, and is very much well, involved. Well, actually, in- I've I've got to disagree with you because you know a whole lot of what I do is uh, observe every darn editorial cartoon that comes in. And uh, during the years of Bush's uh, run up to war in Iraq, um, there were remarkably few cartoons that were pushing back against that. And I was surprised by that. And frankly, as I look back on my own cartoons, um, I'm not proud of uh, all of the supporting of the war in Iraq cartoons that I drew. I regret that. But it's very hard to find cartoonists who were not on that bandwagon. Very, very few. And, well, there, there, uh, there I was, and there I was again, going against the flow, right? Being, being I, the- I would like, oh, what I was would I? like was, to see hey, some of those cartoons Darryl, because Darryl. I really remember it being so rare oh, to no, see back. one of those. Uh, go back. I, and, I, and, and, and I, well, and I grab, grab a couple and send them to me because it's and, easier and for you to know you where to they are. Me. I, da- I challenge you after after viewing them to call me Neville Chamberlain again because I was on the right side of history then and I'm on the right side of history now. It's just okay, but I should mention that you were just making the argument that many of the liberal cartoonists took that position at that time, and I'm saying that they did not. No, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, Rivers, that's the end of our uh, argument about Ukraine, and I think that'll make a lovely podcast, and uh, I'm so glad that you and your small minority of Republicans are not in charge of policy on this, but no matter how wrong you are, you draw really great. Well, thank you, Daryl. And anytime you want me to come back to whip your butt uh, in front of millions of people, you go right ahead. I'm right here. Okay, so remember to uh, like and subscribe to Kegelcast, and uh, we will see you on the next Kegelcast.